Tena koutou katoa, ko Alex Tan aho, he aorangi aho mo te matai tonga rapu i te whare wananga o Waitaha. Greetings to everyone. I'm Alex Tan. I'm head of department and professor of political science here at the University of Canterbury. Tonight, I have the honor of moderating this UC Connect event on dope or no, UC experts discuss the cannabis referendum. The year 2020 has been a very tumultuous year, to say the least. The COVID-19 pandemic that is still occurring around the world has made some or many of us want to hit the reset button or just even to restart the whole 2020. The event this evening was supposed to be hosted uh, in the Nayo Marsh Theater of our beautiful Hairoa UCSA Student Center that is nestled in our picturesque campus that is just screaming spring has definitely arrived. Unfortunately, the health alert level two that is still effective today prevented us from welcoming you, our audience, to our campus. Fortunately for all of us, with the quick thinking of our colleagues and the excellent IT infrastructure at the University of Canterbury, it allows us to be flexible in delivering tonight's event online. In the midst of all these hullabaloo, we here in New Zealand is having a general election scheduled for October 17. In this year's general election, there are two referenda items that New Zealanders are being asked to consider. One on end of life choices and second one on cannabis legalization and control. Tonight's UC Connect discussion is on the second referenda item, cannabis legalization and control. I'm joined here tonight by several of my esteemed colleagues here at the University of Canterbury who have thought, studied, and researched about the issues relating and surrounding cannabis legislation and control. They will be speaking and presenting on aspects and implications of cannabis legalization and control from their different fields of expertise. Allow me to briefly introduce tonight's panelists, Professor Neil Boyster, who is the head of, of the School of Law, Dr. Rachel Dixon from the UC School of Health Science, Dr. Jared Gilbert, who is the director of the Criminal Justice Program here at the University of Canterbury, and Dr. Sarah Whitcomb-Dobbs, who is a child and psych family psychologist. Each of the panelists will be given 15 minutes to do their brief presentation. After all the presentations are completed, we will have the remaining 20, 25 minutes uh, for questions and answers. For our audience at home, please send in your questions to us. Ensure that the questions are brief and go straight to the point. We will collect all of the questions and pose it at the end. Uh, and in the interest of time, we will be choosing uh, the many questions that we get and pose it to our speakers. Now, on to the panelists and their presentation. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Neil Boyster, head of the School of Law, UC Law <coughs> School. Uh, Neil will discuss the legal difficulties at domestic level and at an international level about the proposed legislation. The domestic model for New Zealand will be compared to models already in use by other states, including Canada, the United States, and Uruguay, and whether it addresses the problems they have encountered how the proposed legislation fits with New Zealand's international legal commitments to control cannabis will also be discussed. So over to you, Neil. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks very much for this opportunity to just talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, the bill and the proposed uh, referendum. I thought I'd start, actually, by just reminding uh, voters, all of you, what you're facing. So you're going to be asked about a, spe a really specific question. Do you support the proposed cannibal, cannabis legalization and control bill? And you can choose one of two answers. You can say, yes, I support the proposed cannabis legalization and control bill. Or you can uh, vote, no, I do not support the proposed cannabis and legalization control bill. I was looking at this uh, earlier today, and I was thinking to myself, it's framed in quite an interesting way because in effect you're being asked an abstract question, do you support legalization? And a concrete question, do you support legalization in this particular form? Right? In this particular form as it's been spelled out at some length uh, by the government uh, 
in the uh, referendum, uh, in the bill which was released before the referendum. So, uh, and I don't think you as voters should forget that. You, you're, you're effectively being asked this dual uh, question. You're being asked, do you support legalization, which is a, an historic opportunity actually in this country and uh, globally, and you're being asked about a specific model of regulation, which is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk. But before I do that, I'm not going to go into whether cannabis is harmful um, and the endless debates there are about cannabis harm. Others will talk raise some of these issues. There is, seems to me to be little doubt that, the, that the, uh, the research shows conclusively that cannabis is a harmful substance and it does cause harm. Um, and it's really that it, and how, how you quantify that harm, et cetera, that is uh, really not within my the zone of expertise. I think one of the most interesting quotes I read about um, drugs generally and drug problems is, we get to choose the kind of drug problem we have, but we do not get to choose not to have a drug problem. So, and, and much the same can be said about cannabis. We get to choose the kind of cannabis problem we have, and this bill is about choosing the kind of cannabis problem we have. We don't get to choose not to have a cannabis problem. Or well, that seems highly, highly improbable to me uh, under current, uh, current uh, norms in society. So, you know, we, we have a situation where the strength of cannabis um, historically has been growing in strength. I'm not going to go into that. To the yield of uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the main psychoactive uh, ingredient, is growing in many uh, uh, the available substances. It binds with receptors in our brain. That's way beyond my, <laughs> my skill set, too. What I would like to say, though, something initially about is the history of uh, cannabis control. In order to try to remind uh, the viewers that actually this, the way the law is today and the prohibition system we have now is actually a, con uh, it, it has a particular historical context. It's not, it hasn't been the case that the law has always been this way. In fact, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. The, uh, in the 19th century, cannabis was uh, regulated in a patchy, if at all, in a patchy way across um, the globe. In the 20th century, in the early part of the 20th century, as the global drug control movement grew in, 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 in its authority and in its influence, other opium was the main, uh, the main focus, and cannabis was largely ignored up until the, the, 19, uh, early, the early part of the League of Nations, the 1920s. And it was through pressure from Egypt, which had identified a cannabis problem, that it slowly began to be mentioned at international fora, which had been devoted to opium control, not to cannabis control, and much to the embarrassment of most of the delegates to those, uh, to those uh, meetings under the League of Nations auspices, without any, or without any um, kind of empirical basis for it. It was just introduced slowly, piece by piece, what happened up until the, in the 1930s is the same conversation, a very, very strong in rhetoric, very low on evidence was going on, and then it was picked up, of, uh, unfortunately, we can say unfortunately because it's the way the system is now, by the United States in the 1930s. We were coming out of alcohol prohibition. Many of the alcohol prohibitionists moved into narcotics prohibition shortly afterwards, and they, they, um, they sought a, a range of substances and identified amongst the others heroin, cocaine, etc., cannabis as a substance which they could focus on, and there was a lot of activity around cannabis. Uh, uh, still not a global uh, prohibition until, in effect, after the Second World War, when the US became a dominant global power without any, uh, without any real challenges, and uh, other than the Soviet Union, which wasn't a, a major player in drug control. It was at that point that it began to introduce it into the treaty system and it was the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs which finally set up a global prohibition system in respect of cannabis. It's contained, cannabis is mentioned in two schedules, Schedule 1, which is the dependence reducing gun, uh, drugs, and then again in Schedule 4, which is the list of the most dangerous drugs, without any really real empirical basis for that. It was put in there through political pressure, and I suppose that's the point I'm going to make, is that the construction of cannabis control is a very heavily politicized uh, uh, system. It's interesting that if you go back to the late 19th century, the Indian Hemp Commission, which was set up by the 
British uh, in 1894 because they were concerned about tax revenues in, in India, when it was then British India. They took a much more nuanced look at cannabis and the problems that it creates in society, and I'm not denying that it does because it certainly does. Uh, and they, they suggested a system of restriction and regulation, regulation and restriction of cultivation, of, of sale, of possession, all of which had to be taxed adequately. So that commission raises the questions as I, I see them, which are key to understanding any kind of regulatory system like the one we're being uh, faced with in this current uh, coming election. You, we have to set up a system of regulating production, and we have to decide who is going to produce it, where, and what are they going to produce, what strength of substance, etc. We also have to set up a system about use, about who is going to be able to purchase it, who is going to be able to use it, where are they going to be able to use it. And then we're going to have to set up, a, well, if you follow that line, a tax system, a tax on what? On the, on the, on the strength of the psychoactive uh, properties or on the weight of the, the substance, etc., etc. Various countries, and this was the, uh, the main thrust of my talk, Various countries have adopted various models. We're sitting at a prohibitionist end, as are most countries in the world today, the prohibitionist end of drug control. And cannabis is prohibited with heavy use of the criminal law. Other, other states have moved quite significantly. Canada, um, uh, well, it's, uh, if you go to the most commercialized end, you would, you would have the states within the United States, Colorado, Washington State, etc., etc., where effectively they've embraced laissez-faire principles of the market, and they've embraced free enterprise, and they've controlled, they've regulated. It's not a complete free-for-all, but they have permitted advertising because they have uh, First Amendment problems with controlling advertising. They've permitted um, uh, the, uh, the kinds of, of behavior which this bill does not permit. And so this is a much more restrictive bill. If you move slightly towards the more restrictive end, then you get to, say, the Canadians, who also have a free market, in, in, except in some of the provinces. Uh, some of the provinces, the, it's actually the province that provides the substance itself rather than the... Um, but others, I think, two of, the, two of them, the province provides four provinces the actual it's a it's a free market and but they permit uh, electronic commerce in cannabis so there's still a, a reasonable amount of flexibility mm. in the market but you can go all the way to the Uruguayan model which does not permit uh, commercial activity the state is the supplier the state supplies through pharmacies people are allowed to grow cannabis in clubs and and to supply it amongst themselves but certainly not for commercial gain uh, so it's a heavily regulated system. And the question which a lot of the literature which focused on these various regulatory models has asked is, uh, you know, to what extent should we be trying to keep the market at bay in these systems? You know, to what extent should we be keeping commercialization at bay? How? And I must say, personally, I'm quite attracted to the Uruguayan model. I don't, I, you know, I, I've worked for tobacco, uh, anti-tobacco NGOs, and I'm apprehensive about the rise of big cannabis mm. and what that could mean mm. uh, in this country. Although I'm not sure that this act would permit the rise of big cannabis in any really significant sense. Uh, so the Uruguayan model did a, uh, did have some appeal when the Spanish have a similar sort of um, uh, system of, of, of effectively small scale not-for-profit production or state production of the, of the drug. So if we look at our proposed bill, I'm not going to go through the thing in any great detail in comparison to these various other models. It, it sets up a cannabis uh, regulatory authority, which, is a, a, which would be a government authority, and that authority then intervenes right across the board from the production it, by licensing, so it uses licensing to control who is going to produce, who is going to supply, and who is going to use it. Even I was looking last night, and it even regulates not only the, the organizations that can apply for licenses to produce or supply, etc., but it regulates who may manage their outlets and even the people who can work in those outlets. So it's much more intrusive. So if you put it on the scale, a continuum, 
it would be much closer to the heavily regulated end of things than the US model. So that any kind of comparison to what's going on in Colorado, etc., you should be very skeptical about drawing it, uh, those sorts of comfortable, quick comparisons because they are in a much more commercial model than the one that's being proposed here. It, uh, it uses licensing, it uses taxation, um, a whole range of other controls. It, 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 it's very, very restrictive of, of marketing. I was trying to figure out how, in fact, you were going, as an ordinary consumer, you were going to be able to identify where the shop was. Mm -hmm. They were so restrictive uh, because it cannot be identified on the outside. They can only use price lists on the inside, etc., etc. So the model is very restrictive. Uh, and uh, the enforcement provisions that are coupled to it are also fall back on the criminal law again. So um, just like the Misuse of Drugs Act now, the Misuse of Drugs Act makes uh, very heavy penalties for supply. But if you're going to supply and you don't have a license, you're going to be opening yourself up to a massive fine under this, under this new proposed legislation. So the criminal law is present there. This is not a complete free-for-all. The criminal law has intruded quite significantly. It claims to have um, harm reduction uh, uh, purposes and it, it tries through the legislation to introduce harm reduction principles into the, the actual practice of retail of cultivation retail etc of these substances it remains to be seen how effective these things will be because of some of them I was you know actually going to be very difficult to interpret so that is my uh, the, 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 the current law as it stands I could just give you an, uh, an example of the kind of offense if you supply to a, a, a 14 grams uh, to someone under the age of 20, for example, you, um, you, you could well open yourself up to a $5,000 fine. You supply more than 14 grams, which is the standard allowable amount. 14 grams is about that much in a plastic packet, I think. Um, you're going to op open yourself up to a $3,000 fine, but the really heavy financial penalties come in against the organization if they don't have the correct licenses. So, uh, so it is regulatory and it does use those very heavy regulatory uh, mm. controls. In fact, I've never seen, I, I, I hadn't realized it was quite as heavily regula regulated as it actually is. So that's me, thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And I really appreciate uh, uh, you giving us the, the legal aspect around the bill and, and uh, the history itself of uh, cannabis regulation internationally. So uh, it really gives us uh, a lot of food for thought and certainly the, the audience at home. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it and keeping to the time as well. So on to our next speak, speak, speaker, uh, uh, Rachel Dixon, who is uh, with our School of Health Science uh, here at the University of Canterbury College of Education, Health and Human Development. Rachel will talk about the approach to cannabis education in secondary schools. Cannabis is explored as part of alcohol and drug education in health and PE uh, in New Zealand curriculum, which is framed by a well-being, social, ecological, and a harm minimization approach. Rachel will unpack what this means in terms of what is covered in cannabis education, as well as how it is approached by teachers and schools to bring about learning. So on to you, Rachel, and I think you have some uh, slides to share. Go ahead. Uh, Namahi kia koutou, ko Rachel Dixon toko ima. Um, so it has been, um, has been introduced, I'm a lecturer in the um, School of Health Sciences. I teach health education as part of the Bachelor of Health Science and also in teacher education, preparing uh, teachers of primary level and secondary level students to uh, be confident in teaching health education. Um, tonight I want to convey that health education is a very much a reciprocal process of teaching and learning and not about lecturing at all. Uh, so what do we want from cannabis, alcohol and other drug education in schools? Over preparing students for the risks a few will face while under preparing them for the decisions all of them will make, or building knowledge, values and competencies such as critical thinking so that all students are prepared to thrive in a modern world. This second statement from Ben Berkzang to me uh, encapsulates the intent of alcohol and drug education in the New Zealand curriculum and health education more broadly. Alcohol, cannabis and drugs are part of any society. They are not going anywhere. 
which means there's always going to be a need for education around reducing drug-related harm and risks and promoting well-being in drug-related situations. So what numbers are we uh, talking about when we look at um, young people's drug use? Recently released uh, data from the Youth 2019 survey indicate that 4.1% of young people uh, responding to the survey uh, were weekly or um, use cannabis weekly or more often, um, while almost a quarter of the young people surveyed had used cannabis at least once. And these numbers were more pronounced the older the young people in the survey. So there was an age bracket of between 13 and 17 years old for that study. Uh, Binge drinking by teenagers has consistently fallen since the survey began in the year 2000, as have uh, levels of smoking. In fact, rates of vaping have overtaken levels of smoking amongst those surveyed. The approach to drug education in the New Zealand curriculum, um, as it was said in the introduction, is one of harm minimisation, which is consistent with the New Zealand National Drug Policy. In curriculum terms, drug education is typically taught as part of health education, which is part of the health and physical education learning area. And within health education, it is taught as part of the key area of learning called mental health. As such, uh, focus is given to building knowledge and understanding of drug-related issues, developing young people's skills to think critically and to analyse messages about alcohol and other drugs, and refining skills in problem-solving, decision-making and effective communication. So this means that cannabis education is framed within a well-being or being well approach rather than a biomedical and risk focused discourse. Uh, the effectiveness of health education in um, the school setting is measured on students' learning outcomes, not behavioural outcomes. And this is important to consider when we place expectations on teachers of health education about what they are realistically able to achieve and what is beyond their control. So health education is mandated until the end of year 10, after which uh, health education becomes an optional subject for the NCA level. So that's year 11, 12 and 13, so the final year, three years of schooling. As you can imagine, young people who study health education past year 10 are able to explore alcohol, cannabis and other drugs in more comprehensive, complex and critical ways. Uh, but for most students whose health education learning ends at year 10, uh, cannabis will typically be explored in drug education units of learning. So, for example, students might explore ways in which cannabis use might impact upon their own and others' well-being, investigate health-promoting strategies that can be enacted to reduce alcohol-related, uh, cannabis-related harm, analyse cannabis messages uh, from the media and popular culture from policymakers and others around them, interrogate attitudes and values held by people about cannabis-related issues, practice skills in being assertive, resisting peer pressure and positively interacting with others and be given a starting point to think critically about the world in which they live. Uh, the vast majority of this is what I would call non-googleable knowledge and understandings which opens opportunities for teachers and their learners to actively construct, uh, deconstruct and reconstruct their roles within a classroom environment where issues close to people's hearts and bodies are being talked about and societal messages that circulate young people are being explored. Uh, Toby Morris, for the spin-off, illustrates here several ideas. You can tell I'm a teacher because I've got all these nice little visuals here. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, I like colour. Um, illustrates several ideas that could be used within a health education classroom context um, to unpack issues relating to cannabis and alcohol use. For example, this visual could spark discussion about cultural factors influencing drug use, the difference between social norms are between um, alcohol and other drugs, reasons why legalisation of cannabis could increase or reduce patterns of use in different population groups, or where we would sit if debate centred upon the legal status of alcohol. Another example, I was on a Zoom with teachers uh, last week talking health promotion. Uh, someone raised the idea of getting their learners to apply knowledge of effective health promotion actions by designing from scratch a health promotion strategy um, for cannabis, if it is to be legalised. And for me, this is the beauty of health education, applying knowledge and understanding to a real life issue, which could easily have an audience beyond teachers and peers in a classroom, enabling young people to have a voice in their world. <laughs>
Research from the Dunedin and Christchurch cohort studies indicate that delaying cannabis use until 18 years or older is critically important in reducing long-term risks of psychosis from cannabis-related um, use, from cannabis use, sorry. Professor, Professor Richie, Richie Popton, director of the Dunedin study, asserts that treating cannabis as a health issue rather than a criminal issue opens up more opportunities for exploring cannabis education in the school setting. <coughs> Indeed, health education in the curriculum provides a well-established framework for exploring health issues. I do believe that if the Cannabis Legalisation and Control Bill is ultimately passed, then teachers will devote more time to providing meaningful cannabis education in um, their classrooms. Alongside this then comes more, mm -hmm. and I, I must say, and they need to be supported by school leadership that prioritises time for health education as well. Um, this gives more opportunities for students' development of all those things I talked about before, uh, decision-making, critical thinking, interpersonal skills and context of cannabis, uh, to mention a few valued learning outcomes. Now, moving beyond the classroom, because um, the classroom's just one little small spot in the school, um, the New Zealand curriculum recognises that teaching is only one part of the educative process. Learning is enhanced when students are engaged at school, feel that they belong and are valued. A whole school approach to promoting well-being in context of drugs involves everyone in the school community working together. This image from the Education Review Office uh, captures the idea that a wide range of professionals act in the school setting. With the uh, triangle, the top bit there, the biggest bit of, the biggest bit of the triangle there, um, this is promoting well-being for all students at all times where um, curriculum teaching and learning comes into play. Um, respond to issues as they arise for some students, sometimes, which is the middle part of the triangle, and that's where pastoral care systems in the school might kick in. And respond to crises as they arise for a few students. And that little, little bit of a slice of the triangle at the bottom is where the school will um, engage with external expertise around addiction, mental health, um, services as appropriate. This whole school approach and the resourcing that exists to Support it provides a robust framework within which schools are well positioned to promote well-being in relation to cannabis, alcohol and other drugs. And of course respond to issues if and when they arise. This is supported by recent investment by the Ministry of Education to the tune of almost $200 million, uh, which includes significant funding injections for guidance counsellors in schools as well as health education curriculum expertise. An example of a resource in schools uh, to support a uh, whole school approach in context of drugs is the New Zealand Drug Foundation's To Do Project, uh, which aims to support schools to take a whole school approach uh, for student wellbeing and prepare those young people for a world where alcohol and other drugs exist. Uh, I recommend having a good look around this site. The resources are fabulous and includes um, not only whole school stuff, but some curriculum units of learning, um, and not just health education, but we've got geography, maths, and English as well. So uh, learning opportunities across the curriculum exist around alcohol and uh, other drugs as well. In conclusion, uh, quality cannabis education is part of a meaningful health education and is part of a whole school approach to well-being. can support rangatahi to become uh, confident, connected, actively involved, and lifelong learners. This is, after all, the vision of the New Zealand curriculum. If the Cannabis and Legalisation and Control Bill is successful, then as health educators we will adjust and strengthen our programmes around cannabis education. But as to the extent to which drug issues in this scenario would impact upon young people and the adults who work with them in schools, well that's just one of life's uncertainties. Thank you very much Rachel, really appreciate it. Um, Okay, um, really appreciate the, uh, the, the, the introduction by Rachel about the whole education system and how we can support uh, when, if, if this uh, uh, bill passes through. And more importantly, I, uh, you know, uh, Rachel brings a lot of information about um, you know, what happens in, this, in the education sector of how we actually, as a society, uh, help along our youth to be able to make proper decisions get themselves informed about drugs and alcohol, which is really, you know, ever present in our society to begin with. So I uh, really appreciate that. And the, the, the websites that uh, Rachel has suggested, I think it's a good, good point for our audience to also check it out.
to keep themselves informed about what's happening with all these issues. On to our next speaker, uh, my colleague here, uh, uh, Jared Gilbert. We used to share the same floor until we were kicked out of our building uh, when it was being renovated, right? So uh, Jared is a, a lecturer in sociology, senior lecturer in sociology, and director of the criminal justice program here. Um, and uh, he will look into the impact of criminal penalties on cannabis users and what groups were most affected by it. He will con also, in his uh, presentation today, he will also consider uh, the question as to whether or not past convictions should be expunged from people's records. All right, so without further ado, my colleague, Jared. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, <clears throat> and I must say, um, thanks, Rachel, to you too. I really did enjoy that. And excellent use of Toby Morris' cartoons. <laughs> he's, he's, he's absolutely brilliant, isn't he? I think he does a great job. And actually, Neil, I learned as much today yeah. about the cannabis referendum from your <laughs> um, from your presentation as I, as I thought I knew before. So um, I thank you too. But all kudos, I think, to you, Alex, for dropping into your introduction the word hullabaloo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, it's now my goal for the evening to try and crowbar hullabaloo into my into my <laughs> presentation. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And if I can't do that, um, hopefully, um, at least in some small part, um, contribute to what is an incredibly important um, conversation. So um, who does the current law, uh, law impact on and should the convictions be expunged? Well, not the first is relatively straightforward, actually. The second, um, much more difficult. So let's see how we go. The impacts of cannabis being illegal in New Zealand um, are actually really significant and they're quite broad. In fact, I would argue that in some part they impact on all of us. The policing of cannabis over the years has cost an enormous amount of money in a, in, a, in a limited pool, which means, of course, those resources can't be spent elsewhere, which um, in some small party through taxpayers or through um, uh, certain crimes not being um, investigated as well as they could do, then this has an impact um, on all of us. And uh, of course, this is for a behaviour um, using cannabis, which is normal. I think the numbers on it suggest that we can't call it abnormal. 80% um, of people use it by the age of 21. Between 500 and 600,000 people um, have uh, used cannabis last year alone. Um, this is a normal activity and for a normal activity uh, it's also got relative, the relative harms are low. So not, not to say, Neil, that, they, that that's harmless, of course it's not, and I think we can all accept that it's an important um, point that we do, in fact. But if you compare it to some legal drugs in New Zealand, then uh, they, it's relative, uh, its relative harms are certainly um, less. Say what you like about New Zealand's drug laws and its categorisation. You can't say it's rational um, in any way, shape or form. So the financial impacts and the imp impacts on all of us uh, occur in some way, but for users the impacts are certainly skewed and, um, and, 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 and certainly uneven. And I want to just quote a notable lawyer, Graham Edger, on this, and he, and he did this on Twitter, which means it's very short. Twitter being that terrible platform, but for just every now and then it has its uses for viewing cute pictures of cats um, and for <laughs> things that Graham Edgler says. So, um, so Graham said um, this, and I just thought it summed things up um, particularly well uh, for me. I'll be voting yes in the cannabis ref referendum um, because I think it is wrong, not entirely, but mostly in the sense of immoral, to have a criminal law which rich white brown people can breach with impunity, which lands poor, the poor and brown people with life-altering criminal convictions. It's pithy, but it's certainly true. And personally, I don't use cannabis. Um, I prefer wine, which is a far more harmful substance, actually alcohol being a far more <laughs> harmful, harmful substance to New Zealand's community. If you look at um, the amount of crimes that are occurred on alcohol, it's far more than any other um, drug um, in the country. But I know people who use cannabis, peers who peers of mine who use cannabis, in fact we all will I'm sure, um, who can use it with an absolute impunity that if they are caught with the drug they will not be charged. The chances of being charged are damn near zero. But that isn't the case for some members uh, of the community. And here um, we have some most unfortunate circumstances, I think, and um, unfortunate data. Now, I turn now then to Andrew Costa, the new Commissioner of Police, who's come in um, 
I think with, and there's a fair bit of hope around Andy Costa, I think, within the police. He's a young police commissioner, maybe he's an incredibly intelligent um, man, and he has, does seem to be driven in a, in a kaupapa, which I think most people can perhaps buy into, and that is around preventing crime. But he told the Waitangi Tribunal just on the 23rd of May, just very recently, he said that he acknowledges Māori are disproportionately represented at every stage of the criminal justice system. He also acknowledged that there is bias in policing in New Zealand, and he has publicly stated that, he, um, that mitigating that bias is high on his list of priorities which he wishes to advance during his time as Commissioner. And he also called that uh, before the Waitangi Tribunal, just recently, in, just in May, for a kaupapa inquiry where all of the interconnected components of the criminal justice system can be considered, and he sees great value in that. I mean, that is something I think most people in this panel would um, agree with. Certainly, I do, and it's not a novel idea. Just last year, Crown Law argued for the same thing, and I think if we spoke to any Māori, they would tell you that that's been called for long before that um, as well. So without question, Māori are overrepresented, are impacted poorly on the illegal status of cannabis um, in New Zealand. Certainly Māori are twice as likely than non-Māori to use cannabis, but they're three times as likely to face prosecution. Um, and with those prosecutions, of course, Māori and others who are caught up um, in uh, convictions of cannabis are struck with a burden that um, is not just a stigma of cannabis, I'm not entirely sure if there is much of one actually, but certainly it has certain detrimental effects around um, certain jobs that you can get um, on restricting travel um, and the like. Now, in some ways, actually, the police are solving this problem. Not the problem of bias, they're going to have a hell of a time doing that, it's going to be a big old task. But they are actually solving the problems of um, convictions. And how are they doing that? They're not charging people. So the number of charges that are being brought for cannabis offences has been, has been dropping for many, many years, but steepling in recent times. In fact, from two, between two, uh, 2010 and 2019, it's dropped by around 64% of all charges to do with cannabis. Um, so it's um, last year fewer than 3,000 charges. Um, around 50-something percent of those were for use or for possession. Mm. They are falling steeply. Um, and actually, this year, you will see that you may even see that number half because of changes to the uh, Misuse of Drugs Act, an amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Act that occurred just last year, which is pushing people, um, instructing the police to push even more into um, health related uh, consequences for, for drug taking. So we might just say then. If no one is being prosecuted, or so few people are being prosecuted and those numbers are continuing to fall, then the problem is solved. Um, no, I would argue, in fact, the contrary. Um, we must look at the criminal justice system of what its component pieces are ought to be doing. It is for Parliament to decide what the laws are and the police to then enforce them. It's not up for the police to decide whether or not they should charge somebody or not. The law is there and they should be enforcing that law. Not notwithstanding discretion is important, but when they're in toto um, removing um, the, uh, the, the chances of prosecution, the law becomes an ass. Um, and I would argue then that the politicians are not doing their job by allowing that situation to occur. They're being cowardly, in fact, and this uh, referenda allows the public to um, correct that. Uh, and, I do, and I hope indeed that they do. Now, if indeed that comes to pass, uh, if the law is changed and cannabis is made illegal, then we have this quite niggly question, actually, as whether or not we ought expunge the convictions of people charged with um, cannabis offences. Now, there is a precedent for this um, internationally, of course. Neil, you mentioned America. There are a number of states in America, I think New York, um, Illinois, California, I think, have all expunged um, cannabis um, convictions. There is also, of course, precedent in New Zealand um, after the homosexual law reform was passed in 1986, I think. Many years later, they, um, you can apply now if you're convicted of crimes of homosexuality for those to be um, expunged. So we do have precedent for this. So should people prosecuted with uh, uh, people who have got cannabis convictions, be uh, should those convictions be expunged? Well, the answer to that is no, um, in toto, I don't think we would want to expunge 
all prosecutions, for example, or all convictions, for example, if people were engaged in organised crime and that had um, elements of violence connected to it, I think we would be very uncomfortable if we were doing that. I think if people were selling cannabis um, wholesale to children or anything like that, I think we'd be deeply uncomfortable about um, expunging prosecutions in that area, which then leaves us with the idea, well, okay, we don't want to perhaps do it, or there, or there may not be a... Uh, it may not be palatable to do it for all convictions, but can we do it for minor offending? Uh, and this is something that has been um, encouraged by the Drug Foundation, um, by the Helen Clark Foundation and others. But I do wonder how many people in reality this would actually benefit. Because most people with minor drug convictions, I would suggest, have convictions, have other convictions as well. Mm. Having sole cannabis convictions would be very, very rare. I don't have the data on that, but I hypothesise that would be mm. the case. And if that is true, expunging cannabis convictions would have very limited effect on those um, demonstrable difficulties that people with convictions have, of course. Um, and furthermore, if that was single cannabis use, for example, a single cannabis use conviction, we actually already have a mechanism um, in law to, um, to, to, to remove those, um, and that is the clean slate legislation. So after seven years, th those will automatically be removed from your record in most instances um, anyway. Now, notwithstanding that, however, there will still be some people who are affected by cannabis um, convictions if this law is overturned. Um, and should we expunge them? Well, there may be a reason we do it that isn't necessarily about the individual. The overrepresentation of Māori, which is, this is an issue for Māori, without question. The overrepresentation of Māori in the criminal justice system, I would argue, is not just one of the biggest issues facing criminal justice in New Zealand. I would argue, in fact, that it's one of the biggest issues facing New Zealand um, across the board. And it would send, I think, a really important message to Maori communities that we are taking um, initiatives to, or that we're taking the initiatives to um, correct the imbalance of Maori representation seriously. That may well be a political factor of why we would do this. And in fact, in some ways, I would be in favour of that. If we're going to make bold moves um, to correct the imbalance of Maori representation, then it's this type of thing that I think symbolically that we perhaps should be doing. But will it be done? Will they actually do it if this law passes? I would say no. I would say not in your alley. I don't think there's a hope in hell, to be honest. And the reason for that is I mentioned the homosexual um, law reform and that, that, that prosecutions can be expunged for that if you apply for it. It's not automatic. It's if you apply for it. That only came about some 20 years after the law was put in place. And I would have thought that the arguments for homosexual law reform would have been far stronger. The expungement of prosecutions would be far stronger than they are here for a number of reasons. So uh, I just don't think it's going to happen, but I generally see it um, as probably a good thing, although how many people it actually affects in reality um, is probably pretty moot. But of course, all of this is in itself moot because we don't even know whether or not uh, cannabis is gonna be made legal. We'll have mm. that, we will, we'll have that um, knowledge in a month or two uh, and I guess we wait with bated breath for that. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much, Jared. Uh, very thought-provoking uh, information that and, and presentation that uh, you did. I was busy copying down notes here, uh, but uh, you know, uh, really appreciate how you posed the question of the differential cost to society and particular groups within society with regards to. Uh, uh, past convictions and usage of, of cannabis, the idea of discriminatory effect, so to mm. speak, and bias, right? And I really like it uh, when you paint that picture of how, you, how we envision this cannabis usage and legalization issue in the broader landscape of New Zealand criminal justice uh, law and you know, if we're gonna reform it, how are we going to do that? That's a uh, really big questions, and I, I didn't get in hullabaloo though, did I? No, no, I didn't. no, no. But that's all right. That's all right. I'll use it. <laughs> yeah, good on you. Good on you. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, it's really uh, uh, very thought provoking, and I'm sure our audience really appreciated how you presented the issue to them as well. Thanks, Alex. And uh, let me uh, 
turn to our last speaker, but definitely not the least, uh, Dr. Sarah Whitcomb Dobbs, uh, who is a, a child and family psychologist in uh, private practice. Sarah will be speaking uh, about the proposed legislation's potential impact on mental health and addictions with an emphasis on disadvantage uh, or vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, Sarah supports evidence-based drug reform approaches that view substance use as a health issue, not a criminal just uh, not a criminal justice issue. Uh, so on to you, Sarah. Thank you. Do um, I need to pass this to you? Kia ora koutou. So um, thank you, thank you, Alex. So I'm a child and family psychologist. I actually, for the past several years, I've um, been teaching and lecturing here at UC in the School of Health Sciences, um, training child and family psychologists to work across a range of different sectors in society so that we, t um, we train psychs who work in the health, education, social welfare and non-governmental sectors. Um, so I am speaking um, from a from a professional and an academic perspective today, but I also have, I guess, a a personal interest in that I've got um, four four kids myself, all of whom are now teenagers, and and who all actually have a really healthy interest in this particular um, this particular bill. So um, so my my long term interest in terms of my my practice is around the child protection sector. So um, so I'm really interested in this in terms of how this bill might affect our most vulnerable children and those in society and those are the ones who are growing up um, exposed to child abuse and neglect. And so that's my area of research, but it's also been my area of practice. And so of course, um, so I've worked with um, kids and families for in, in various different roles and ways for more than 20 years. And in a lot of um, a lot of the families that I've worked with, um, of course, um, the, the, the kids themselves or, or the or the parents um, have been regular or occasional cannabis users. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, about child and adolescent cannabis use um, and some of the outcomes that are associated with that. And and I am going to talk about child maltreatment um, and cannabis and and have a brief discussion on what the evidence suggests. Um, so I think that Rachel covered prevalence of youth, um, youth use of cannabis in Aotearoa New Zealand really well, so I'm not going to go over that, but I will comment that, um, that um, it, the, the data shows, there was a study from Otago last year, that youth use has declined over the past 20 years. And so it, it looks as though um, about... Uh, the Ferguson and Horde, so the um, Christchurch Health and Development Study, suggested that around 10 to 15 per cent of, um, of teenagers were heavy and problematic users of cannabis. Um, it looks from the more recent data as though that's dropped a bit, but it's still hovering around 8 per cent for 15-year-olds for who've used, who reported using cannabis within the past month. Um, so so from, from my perspective, that's still higher than we want. Um, I couldn't find any data on child use um, because uh, most of the uh, prevalence studies are looking at age 13 and up, and it's actually really rare for children to be smoking weed, but um, in terms of uh, my experience and my colleagues' experience is, of course, that occasionally we do come across children as young as nine or 10, who, um, and that's when they first start using and experimenting with cannabis. Now, um, I will make a real comment about that in that that's a really, when we're talking about that triangle that Rachel showed before, we're talking about that real pointy end and, and in my experience those kids are, um, they are experiencing a lot of problems in terms of um, ad adversity within their childhoods and there is um, always a lack of supervisory neglect mm. so, so mum and dad aren't keeping an eye on them and so, and, and they might be hanging around uh, older kids and, and that's kind of the, the method by which they're exposed. Um, as Jared has commented, um, use amongst Māori is um, higher than use amongst non-Māori and, um, and it's, it seems as though from the data as though that's partially due to um, associated with socioeconomic status 
and adversity as well. It's not just ethnicity. So we've got higher higher rates of cannabis use um, amongst more disadvantaged populations as mm. well. Um, so I, I did want to make the point that cannabis cannabis use um, is harmful. I know that you commented on that. Um, I, I guess. It, I've seen a lot of stuff on Facebook and in the media that talks about the health benefits of cannabis, um, but I just wanted to make it really clear tonight that cannabis use and cannabis exposure can be harmful to children. And so it's not a harmless substance. It is, there is, um, there is evidence around pregnant women and breastfeeding women who use cannabis that it can be, there's some evidence for some associated cognitive executive functioning impairments. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of evidence around, um, around increased risk for low birth weight. So, um, mm. so there's some data around child use um, in some states where they have very loose controls um, and, and kids have had some unintended ingestion. Um, but of course there's also the exposure to passive smoking um, around that. So uh, rates of cannabis use amongst people who smoke tobacco is much higher as well. So, um, so we know that there's a bit of an overlap there. Um, and I, I, the, probably the, um, the most amount of information we know is around adolescent use of cannabis. So um, there's, there's reasonably significant evidence for the increased risk for psychosis and schizophrenia. Mm. Um, so so the, um, the, there was an international study published in The Lancet last year that looked, that, that found that daily cannabis use was associated with two to four times increased risk. Um, for first onset psychotic episodes compared to people who've never used it. Now, they estimated that, um, that about 12% of those cases could have been prevented by people not using cannabis. Um, but in Amsterdam, where the, uh, the regulatory framework is, is perhaps less strict around cannabis, they estimated that around 50% of the first psychotic episode cases could have been prevented. Um, now this is, I mean, I, I know that people know this stuff, um, but I guess I'm talking about it in the context of perhaps increased access, if that's going to be the case. Mm -hmm. I'll get to that later. Um, we also know that parents who use cannabis um, have ki their kids are more likely to use cannabis at younger ages, and um, and as as well. Um, Certainly in, in my mahi out in the field, I have walked into homes where um, it's during the day, there are small children in the home and mum and dad are high and they're not mum or dad and they, um, there is concerns around parental neglect. And so in that regard, it's more similar to alcohol in terms of the potential um, impacts on parenting than on smoking because of course there's the, there's the psychotropic effects of, um, of being high. Um, but there's also some evidence for medicinal use in terms of alleviating epilepsy in children and there's been some news articles around that too. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit more about parenting and drug use. Um, find my bit of paper. So we don't have... Um, we don't, I couldn't, we don't have data in New Zealand on how many parents of young children use cannabis regularly. In, in the States, um, rates are about 7% um, of, of parents of younger children um, use cannabis. Um, now the question is, that I'm interested in is around whether um, cannabis use at all um, among parents harms kids and in New Zealand, we don't collect data on how many parents who are involved with Ōranga Tamarihi, so that's our child protection service, um, use cannabis. Uh, but but my um, but we also know from the literature that there's a big overlap. So rates of drug use amongst parents involved with child protection systems is, are much higher than amongst the general population. And in my doctoral research, I um, I was looking at factors that were associated with um, with subsequent maltreatment notifications amongst parents 
who had involvement already with Oranga Tamariki, and um, and the parents in my study reported around five times higher rates of cannabis use than um, than parents in the rest of Aotearoa New Zealand. However, there was no evidence that parents who used cannabis were more likely to have a subsequent notification than parents who didn't use cannabis. So then I, then I guess the question comes to what is the functional impact on parenting of, of using cannabis? So um, is it, um, I, my question that I'm asking as a, as a psychologist is um, when are you using it? Where are you? Um, what are the provisions? provisions in place to ensure that your children are safe. We know that Oranga Tamariki social workers are very unlikely to uplift a child based on cannabis use amongst parents. If they did so, then we would have a very high proportion of um, our children in care, actually. And so it's just a, um, it's actually well understood and well known, not just by the police, but also by the child protection system. Um, so then what, um, what might the implications be for our, our tamariki, our rangatahi in New Zealand of this proposed legislation? Um, and so when I, when I think about this, um, I think about um, uh, the, the biased application of the current law, and Jared talked a little bit about this. This is also true for our um, young Māori males, and so we know that in the youth justice system, um, Māori teenage boys are more likely to be um, to be picked up by police, to be charged, to be convicted, and then to have longer sentences. At every point in our ju criminal justice system, we see that there is systemic racism in the way that this has been applied. Um, to me, this is, um, this is a really harmful effect of the current law. We also know that um, I guess I, I think about uh, treatment services for adult cannabis dependents, people who are, so adults who have cannabis use disorder to the point where they need treatment, often doesn't consider the impact on, um, on kids and so a lot of the people using treatment services will be parents of young children and, um, and I guess I'm, I'm advocating for a whole of government approach and a whole of the health system approach that considers the well-being of kids and young people in the way that we design our services for treating, um, for treating cannabis use as a health issue. Um, I am happy to hear about the increased penalties for sale and supply um, of cannabis directly to children and young people. Um, I know that it's everywhere. The current law as it's implemented is completely ineffective at protecting our kids and young people, in particular our kids and young people in communities where cannabis use is much higher. Um, I would love to see really um, tighter, a, a tighter controls around it and, and my understanding is, is that the proposed legislation is quite robust in doing this. Now on the other hand, I guess I'm thinking about, um, about the perceptions in the minds of young people. What's their facade or about, um, about smoking cannabis um, or using it and in terms of when it's legal and when it's illegal and I do think that it does make a difference um, in their minds in that if it is legalised then, then on the one hand it's great because there's less stigma and on the other hand it looks there's a World Health Organisation um, collaborated with some researchers who did an international study looking at this and it looks as though they're um, across um, different legalisation frameworks that um, legalisation is mildly associated with increased adolescent use after about five years. So it's not sort of an immediate effect, it's more like a down the track effect. Mm. Now I guess for me that's a question mark because that combined a whole lot of different legislative frameworks into, into one study and one odds ratio or one kind of um, risk estimation and um, and so I, I guess it, from my perspective the jury is still out so um, so I thought that the there are some I think overall there will in terms of I see cannabis use for um, for vulnerable families or families where there are lots of other problems happening um, and child abuse and neglect is occurring 
I, I see it as just one little piece in, mm. in this big picture and certainly um, it's not going to make a huge difference. It's not going to fix things like, you know, it's not going to fix child abuse or child neglect. Um, but I think that the removal of the possibility of having a criminal c conviction around it or having it used as a reason for children to be uplifted will reduce family stress. Um, and I do think that it will enable a frank conversation to be had with families about use and the need for and the need for treatment services um, and and a discussion around the impact on the kids uh, and I think that's I think that's a good thing um, so the other the other kind of potential advantage to um, to kids and young people I thought would be that um, would be around that exposure to access to buying um, buying illegal drugs so if you um, have to go to an unsafe environment where, um, where, the, where you can only access cannabis from unsafe people, then families are involved with, um, with kind of, I'm going to say people with other convictions or people with other crime behaviours that they're going to have more, in, you know, they're going to have increased exposure to that and to actually the, the proposed legislation is, is a potential way to reduce that. So, um, so I am, um, in conclusion, I am all for gardening with your children and I note that you're allowed two plants per household or up to four or something like that. Perhaps not that sort of gardening. <laughs> um, and, um, and I absolutely support a whole of government approach um, and a whole of society approach to, to reducing the associated harms of cannabis. Sure, Sarah. Well, this is uh, a lot to uh, think about, and I really appreciate how you put the uh, uh, the issue. And you know, from you know your experience working and counseling uh, 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 in uh, some of the vulnerable populations with regards to cannabis usage and all of that, I, I really appreciate uh, what you what both Rachel and you mentioned. This idea of the whole well-being issue, right? I think. That's a critical issue because uh, oftentimes we find even in alcohol abuse situation, you know, you have individual uh, having this issue, but it affects a family. So, you know, in a way, uh, what we have done today, and I uh, thank you to all of you guys, to Neil, Rachel, Jared, and Sarah, by presenting these different aspects of this issue. As you can see, what, uh, what voters are being asked uh, is, we need to educate ourselves uh, with regards to many of these issues and what it means for our society. And uh, you know, my colleagues are able to assemble such a such a really good crew here uh, to give you just you know different perspective. And I would even say that um, there's still a lot of perspectives that needs to be taken care of and needs to be offered. But this is a this is a start really uh, for us to you know talk about this conversation. Well, um, we have uh, about. Uh, 25 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, we have some questions up uh, that are you know, uh, on the board for us. Uh, I'm just gonna go through uh, uh, some of these questions. Uh, one of these questions first was just uh, for everyone, post for everyone, so any one of you who wants to pick up the question, you know, let's do that. So what is some of the harmful misinformation being circulated about cannabis referendum that is important to keep in mind when voting on the 17th of October? Uh, this is the modern world we live in. We're in fake news, it's misinformation, and, and, uh, and it makes it very difficult for uh, voters to kind of parcel through these uh, issues. Any takers on that? Jared, you want to start? Um, well, I don't have a specific instance, but I think um, as, a, as, a, as a broad rule on any um, topic, actually, um, analyzing where the information coming from is key, isn't it? Having credible sources, and I think that will see uh, that will see you right um, in a number of areas. The darkest recesses of the internet, yeah. I mean, some idiot on Facebook, okay. um, and is not a credible source that you should be getting your information from, um, or yeah, or a number of political parties these days as well, actually. But um, I think I think looking for credibility for sources is the important thing. Yeah, I, I, would, I think I would agree with that. And any, any anybody have other? Uh, perspectives to come in, or have you heard some misinformation uh, that is being circulated around? 
uh, in social media or you know in the internet around this issue I think that um, we all have different perspectives and there's obviously people with strong uh, opinions or perspectives for and against an issue such as this. Yes. Um, so it may not always be misinformation, but it's the perspective of the person, you know, that's coming from. And it, as Jared said, around that credibility, reliability yeah. of information that I would call critical health literacy type skills that are needed to discern all the stuff. Um, but also, information from research and data can be taken in different ways to suit mm. different people's agenda. True, um, true, so true. It, you take sometimes you take and read these things, and you get what it, you get what it, what, from you, what you need from it, or yep. you think, hmm, no, that's not quite right. So it's all subjective. Well, let me move on to the second question because I think that second question also is for for everyone here. Uh, do you think the referendum question is clear? How would you word it if not? <laughs> Let me ask Neil for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does say, um, you know, do you support the proposed cannabis le legalization and control bill? Uh, and I think it's pretty clear. It's pretty, uh, because it has a referent, and the referent is the bill. The unfortunate thing about that, of course, is that I, I'm absolutely sure that 999 percent <laughs> will never look at this bill. Yeah, that's right. And amazing. they will be relying on the kinds of information and advocacy type, advocacy posing as neutral information. They'll be relying on that for their source of information about what's in this bill. So I suppose we should urge everyone to at least go and have a look if possible, but, it's easy to find. But the thing is, do, do people really have to read the bill, though? You can get credible summations. I mean, yes, I've read, I mean, I've read the, a number the of them. The first three pages of the, yeah. of the bill will provide you with a summation. Yeah, great. Yeah. Right. yeah, but you know what it really calls us, is, is, and, and I appreciate what Neil was saying, that the, if you actually uh, read the referendum item, it's pretty much asking, there's a two-dimensionality oh, yeah. there that yeah. requires the voters to understand that there's, you know, there's two dimensions there. Uh, just, just something aside, uh, and actually a shout-out to my... Uh, to my uh, GP, uh, who who uh, I visited uh, uh, several months ago, and he said, "Hey, Alex, uh, I heard that you're uh, moderating this panel." And I, I actually forgot about it, <laughs> and, and, and he reminded me, and he said, "Hey, uh, you know what? Uh, try to read this uh, uh, piece that was uh, produced by published Open Access uh, New Zealand Journal of Medicine, and it's about." you know, the, the, the legislation and how some of the epidemiologists and, and the, the medical community uh, have wrote. And they do by the, the 10 things that's uh, in the legislation. I thought it was quite interesting and just commend anybody who uh, want to read uh, from that side uh, of, 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 the, of the story. All right, uh, should there be increased funding into cannabis education uh, if and when it is legalized? Rachel. Uh, well, we've already got a strong framework of health education in the New Zealand curriculum, and we have a trained workforce, teachers. Um, and the primary school level, it's generalised teachers who teach across the curriculum, but they, unless they're getting to year seven and eight, they're not really exploring drug issues with students anyway. Um, but in secondary schools, we've got specialist teachers who've been trained as health and or, and or physical education teachers as well. Um, but education also happens out there in society, beyond the classroom, beyond um, schools, and that's probably where some more funding could potentially be placed for this sort of thing, I would say. And schools, we're already doing a, um, we've got a framework for a fantastic job to be done already. We've got the funding there, we've got the Ministry of Education coming in on board with some more mental health, mental wellbeing funding, but outside of schools, for sure, absolutely. Anything to add? Uh, Sarah, what do, you, what do you think? I think the, um, the uh, public health campaign um, around tobacco use has been a really good demonstration of, um, of the potential impact that we can have on, on something that is, has got a health... You Drink know. driving too. Yeah, yeah, Very absolutely. Successful. So we know that actually public health education is effective and absolutely I think we need more of it if we're going to go down this, this path. And it, I think it almost allows for it having, um, you know, there's, there's some projected ideas around how that might look. And, and this, is the, this is this idea of switch of resources, right? That the resources that are into prosecution and policing it can be can be moved elsewhere. It will never happen quite as cleanly as that in reality, of course. Yes. But but in, but in theory, it can and, and, and ought. Absolutely yes, ought. Yes, I think we need to. I think we you know we need to prioritise mm -hmm. the education. Um, yes, and indeed, what uh, what Rachel and what uh, Sarah is uh, uh, um, the story that's been uh, told today is the idea that you know we're doing this as a whole. 
yeah. whole school approach, yeah. you know, kind of whole education approach. And if we're freeing up resources on one end, we should reallocate them to really these type of usage, right? Uh, so that's really uh, something that, you know, I, I think that's a great idea, you know, and certainly hope that government will follow through if, yeah. if, uh, if not uh, just in education, of course, but in health as well. And, yes, you know, and, because and it's a, people it's a with mental health issues and things that's like right, this that may right. be exacerbated by cannabis so, use. So I have a concern because the health workforce is really pushed to its limit and yeah. um, we've got um, a health work workforce that, you know, is People are skilled, people are trained, but we do not have a whole um, a whole array of trained health professionals in treating this that will use up the money even. Mm. I don't know where that workforce will come mm. from because I know that we've already got a shortage of, um, of suitably trained and qualified people. And so I, I, so I guess I'm, I'm putting the call out there that the government does need to invest a lot more in the, um, in the education of our health workforce as well. I totally agree with that. And as academics, I will never say no to more <laughs> funding in education, right? I mean, that's just the reality. Yeah. And what is being called with this type of referendum is, you know, you want to educate the public. And it's uh, uh, as, a, as an advanced industrial democracy, you want sophisticated citizens to make informed mm -hmm. decision making, right? So that's what it is. Next question, should a ref referendum like this be binding? Neil? From the legal perspective, mm, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really difficult question, actually. I think probably not. No, I think it's very difficult to bind a government. There's parliamentary sovereignty. It, you know, and for how long? Yeah, and then you've got uh, yeah. So there are all sorts of problems associated with binding referenda, and uh, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm not sure it needed to go to referendum in the first place, to be honest. We have a, um, a, you know, a democracy where we elect officials to do this type of thing for us and to, and to, to use the experts to, to, to yeah. be au fait with the bill That's and right. to the, 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 the right. evidence. Um, to leave it to the public for these types of things, I'm not... I don't think that's anti-democratic. I mean, we've got a representative democracy mm -hmm. and it works very well. Um, I think this was a, um, a cop-out by a politician. Yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah. There's a great danger in setting something up in a referendum. Yeah, I agree. That's right. as, 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 as we've seen in the past, you know, there's, right. there's precedent. That's right, that's right. Uh, the next question, is Aotearoa New Zealand ready for a cannabis economy? We've already got one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have got one. Is the current one yeah, that's capable right. of changing into something else? Yeah. No, no, that's right. That, yeah. And at the moment, those that are benefiting are the people that we may, we may not want to, to, to benefit. Mm. Good point. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that, and that's, that's a key to this, isn't it? It's, that's a good point. it's redirecting um, where that's the profits go. That's right. Um, uh, I saw a brilliant meme by David Cormack the other day. Um, he said, at the moment, the gangs are benefiting um, under this uh, under this proposal. Hospitals will, you know, because there'll be extra funding or some some something as witty like that. But um, I thought it was quite, you know, uh, you know, quite right. I think we do have to think about um, the tax take on this and the the, the benefits that that um, that indeed can have. Very good. On the on to the next question. What should be the uh, legal age limit of cannabis use and purchase in Aotearoa? Well, the bill sets it up as, as, as 20, right? Yeah. 20 is the, yeah. uh, and the penalties for selling or supplying, or su uh, supplying not so high, but the penalty for selling to a 19 year old or is, is high. So it's, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a reasonable level. Where else would you pick it? Well, yeah. it will be debated though, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. alcohol used to be 20, didn't it? You know, not that long ago. Yeah, and if we're talking about neurological development, um, 25, but yeah. that's ridiculous, right? Because yeah. we have we have the age of adulthood yeah. as, as 18, so it's yeah. already a little bit of a discrepancy. Yeah. You know, you can um, you can do everything else. Yeah. I think this is this is one of the things that we could argue about all day and all night. Right? This is an arbitrary number. You know, this is an so, arbitrary number, um, and and and, yeah. it, and it's as good as any. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. Uh, in, incidentally, think, uh, speaking of uh, speaking of the age, uh, right. I noted. Uh, uh, Rachel, your your uh, data there that says that twenty nine percent usage, fifteen to twenty five years old, right around. Is that is that what it is? I think it's that older age group, eighteen to twenty nine, isn't it? Eighteen to twenty nine. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, uh, that New Zealand Journal of Medical, uh, uh, New Zealand N uh, NZJM piece, has <laughs> go through various ages as well. You know, but it, again, like like what everybody's sharing here, it's really quite arbitrary, right? I mean. Do you go older? Do you go younger? You know, and and, yeah, and what does it actually, what does it actually mean? Well, it, it, I guess it, it sets up this idea that t at twenty it's safe to use cannabis, and we don't have data that supports that. Yeah. What we know is that the older you are when you first try it, the better. 
Yeah. Um, and so that's probably the message that we'd be pushing, but is there an inadvertent message in the legislation? Right. But, 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 but I don't think we're saying at 20 it's safe. Yeah. And I know you know that. I think, yeah. I mean, there's just a, you know, you, I, I think if t- to put it older would make the law... Well, it would be uh, ridiculous. It, 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 would, it wouldn't function, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so and, you know, arguably at 20 is it's a line. So it's a tricky yeah. old game. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. According to one of these questions, not on the point of the discussion, but do you see alcohol exposure to children having more or less harm than cannabis exposure? I think the evidence is that it's more harmful. Alcohol is more harmful. Alcohol, alcohol, yeah. alcohol across the board is more harmful. You go down to the, you go down to a, um, an A and E uh, any time on a Friday and Saturday night um, and see what you find down there. Seventy percent of admissions on a Friday Saturday night yeah. are alcohol yeah. related. Um, and, 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 and you'll yeah. find in the police cells exactly the same. Yeah. You, you know, without question, alcohol is a far greater concern to the to, and it to society. Is a relevant question, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's on point. Yeah. Hmm? It's funny because I read something the other day which suggested that if we had an international system that had been developed by the developing world and uh, rather than the, the Western world, we would have a single convention on alcohol, mm-hmm. not on alcohol. Oh, yeah. without question. Yeah. 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 Without yeah, question. Without this is the irrationality yeah. of our drug categorization. Yeah, that's right? true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, that's true. And then, you know, uh, we, we know all these effects and. Uh, about alcohol and, and you know and family as well, right? Uh, do you think uh, this is the right time for this referendum? Uh, should we have asked the question sooner? <laughs> Anyone? I think it's probably it's it's unfortunate that it's in the middle of a COVID nineteen <laughs> because almost certainly the public becomes more conservative during the course of a, in response to a crisis like the current one we're facing mm-hmm. uh, and less willing to take chances or risks or what they perceive to be a risk. How interesting! Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be uh, uh, a very interesting topic to uh, do research on. Uh, seriously, uh, with the New Zealand election survey, you yeah. know, uh, how do we, how do we actually come to make these decisions? How, why did you vote this way? I think that'll be uh, a very neat question, uh, research question to ask, whatever the result would be. Right? Uh, how many people are likely to vote against like, legalization as they currently are involved in selling it illeg- uh, illegally, and is that significant enough to affect the results? I wouldn't think so. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think the numbers would be great enough to affect the result. All right. Any thoughts from the panel? Any uh, on which way the referendum would go? Oof. Well, I thought it was an absolute show in I thought it was an. I thought the um, the referendum came up when there was a zeitgeist for reform, mm-hmm. and then. COVID. COVID comes. So, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I think even before that, the numbers weren't um, weren't weren't particularly Clearly. compelling. Yeah, I, I was. I, I wasn't certain it would. I actually thought the um, end of life had a, had a had a greater chance of getting across the line. This did, which yeah. seems so strange to me in a country like New Zealand, which has got a predilection for cannabis. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm kind of astonished by it. But but, but I, I actually did a very informal, uh, completely unscientific. So uh, please forgive me, um, colleagues. I'm um, in my in my in my stage two class um, at the. Stage Start of um, at the start of the term, and then um, now closer toward the uh, 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 referenda date. And I'm really surprised how many people have shifted um, shifted their views on it, and only shifted um, one way, and that was toward yes, which I thought was quite interesting. I was quite surprised how, some, how conservative mm. many of the young students were um, really? early on. Yeah, I was. You know, I'm I'm really curious as political scientists. You know, I'm curious whether voter turnout affects it. Right? Oh, yeah. So, for example, if we yeah. have if we have higher voter turnout in this particular election, yeah. would would it go one way or another? Well, I think I, th- I think so because because presumably to get that higher turnout, you're going into people the who don't ordinarily population. vote yeah. and and younger. And I would suggest yeah. that those are two demographics that are the dem- demographics that would go in favour. So I think I would argue. Yeah, I firmly believe that a higher turnout will. Cool. We'll favor these. Cool. cool. All right. Is public education, cognition, rational judgment level high enough to make a wise decision in this referendum? Well, I think the answer is we're trying to. <laughs> That's why we organized this panel. Are, are we succeeding? <laughs> are, the, the question for us are we succeeding in giving you more information so that you can make the informed? Uh, uh, judgment, but I think that's. Fine. I'm always in favour of treating people as rational adults, and <laughs> actually, you know, um, when it's it's incredibly patronising to assume that people don't understand what they're voting about. Yeah. I, 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 incredibly charitable. <laughs>
you know, you know, I mean, that's the that's the point of that's the point of what we're doing here today, and and mm -hmm. and, and being here today uh, is the idea that uh, you know part of the university remit, right? I mean, it's our town and gown initiative, right? And you know, as a university, this is where the open discussion <coughs> is, right? The traditional idea of Ateneo, you know, we're in ideas are being spoken. So uh, we hope that uh, today's panel with uh, my colleagues doing all this presentation gives you some information that you can, you know, it, it probably might not be the information that you're looking, but what we're saying here is is that, well, okay, next step, you, you do your homework, mm. right? But this is where we start. It, it's got to start somewhere, It's and I certainly learned a lot, and it was really thought-provoking for me as I maul my own yeah, decision. Yeah. yeah, so, all right. Uh, what are the three key policy issues for Maori surrounding this bill? Uh, Jared, why don't you take that? Uh, well, I think it's the it's the over representation issue. Maori use more, and I come have uh, and face the law disproportionately more. So, uh, you know, I think um, a little bit. Actually, I think it has been said that this isn't going to solve anything for anyone. Actually, on its own, um, it's going to take far more than that. And I think that's true for Maori as well. But I think this probably. It, I think done well, and I think we've got a, a, we've got a bill that can do it pretty well. I think um, then I think it can have some impact on mm. Maori, and, uh, Maori and the criminal justice mm. system. So I think I mean I don't know if I could give you three, um, but certainly it's a I, th I think it's a key issue for Maori, and I and I think if we broke down the demographics of um, which, we, which which way the votes would go, I'd say Maori would be heavily in the game. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, I'll move to the, that that following question rather than the. Uh, how would allowance for growing at home affect the regulation and monitoring of Canada standards? Uh, I mean, I suspect that these sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the impact on, on, on um, control of solvents on, on the material that you smell, uh, that you smoke, etc., etc., pesticides, it, that sort of thing. That is, the research tends to suggest that that has been associated mainly with large-scale uh, commercial operations who are trying to get the most yield out of their crops and they are trying to keep um, and so they're you're picking up a whole lot of uh, uh, other substances as well as just cannabis when you're smoking it mm. uh, people who are doing it at home um, perhaps not having access to the most powerful high yield THC uh, the, the circumstance you know depending on whether they're agronomists but I suspect that most of them yeah. are not yeah. Um, yeah yeah I wonder if that could potentially go the other way though because I think with the regulating the amount of THC in, in the cannabis I think may stop that strength that we see in the market now so it may well be that the regulate I mean that's one of the keys mm. to regulation isn't it that we yeah. that, that, that consumers know what they're actually smoking now whatever you buy you don't know what strength it is mm -hmm. um, whereas if you buy mm. it from a regulated market you will actually have an understanding of that so it it may well be that that's the, 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 the stuff that you grow at home is far stronger. <laughs> you have to get your hands on the far stronger seeds to start with. Though. Yeah. Well, well there, where there's a will, there's a way, Neil. <laughs> Can I just ask a question? Yes, yes. What about synthetics? Like, what effect will this have on, because I know that synthetics are still out there and in mm. yeah. Yeah. What yeah. effect yeah. will this have? Well, well the, the, I think this, this is a, actually a bit of an issue, and it's a big issue, really. And that is, I think we've because we've always called it synthetic cannabis, we've tended to link the two quite closely together. Whereas yeah. in reality, I don't. I think they should be decoupled. Right. I don't okay. actually think there's. I don't think there's any real similarities in them to make them the same drug. They are, I think, entirely different and of entirely different markets. However, in saying that, in saying that, there may be a modest impact. <clears throat> I would argue that um, through substitution, that if something yeah, is legal and easy back. to achieve, then potentially yeah. people might move away from that. But yeah. but once again, I wouldn't be I, I, I wouldn't be confident in that because I do see them as entirely different drugs. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. International drug policy has been informing evidence rather than evidence informing policy. Have New Zealand's academics a role in unraveling the tension, the disparity, corruption? And human rights issues. Any takers on that? Oh, I don't think. I mean, there's a there are a lot of people who work whose whole lives are dedicated to trying to uh, change the international drug control system, and um, and New Zealanders have contributed to that. But I'm not sure that just falls just on us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it really is. Really, there really is a lot of activity. Uh, and it's a, 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 you know which has worked very hard to try to control the international drug control system. But it's it's a system that has a great deal of inertia. 
Yeah. Mm. And you talk about uh, in your presentation about the influence of politics uh, mm. in all of this thing. So that's the, the that's the thing that we are to face. The next question, I think, Rachel can answer that. Are teachers really equipped to deliver this information to teens without bias? I think um, if you listen to my presentation, it really wasn't about delivering information to teenagers because um, teenagers can go out onto Google and find out all the stuff. It's about the critical thinking, the processes behind all that stuff, the decision-making, problem solving. So some of those skills, um, some people will call them soft skills. Um, and when I did my PhD research, I asked students who had done health education in high school what the good things that their teachers did was, and by and large, uh, teachers who are non-judgmental and non-biased in their teaching was key. It's more about enabling discussions and getting students to um, think about um, drug-related situations, um, and I see sexuality-related situations. Um, it's not about the teacher being at the front of the classroom um, putting their views and their biases onto young people because that will turn students off within two mm, minutes. Mm. Well, we have about five minutes left, and I, what I want to do is go to that last question and then ask each of our panelists to come up with maybe a website or a place wherein uh, our <coughs> audience can, can, can click and learn more information. Because the question is about what is the key information to the public? It's actually not what is, because there are lots of information about, uh, that the public would need to know to make an informed decision regarding the cannabis referendum. Where can we find more information? So let's go one by one and, and, and <laughs> name your favorite website, you know, uh, to, to get more information about this. Neil? Well, I would go to the Ministry of Justice website and find the bill. All right. Yeah. Okay. I uh, found what was most useful was the um, Prime Minister's uh, Chief Science Advisors um, website there with the, um, it had like a plain facts version of the, if you vote yes, this is, these are the different things across different uh, areas, um, law, health, education, and all that sort of things. And if you vote no, what would happen with status quo? So that was, that would be my one. All right, Jared? Um, well, I don't think I've probably made a great secret. I'll be voting yes in the referendum. I think overall it's a better policy than, um, the, the, than what we've got now. The proposed legislation is much better than we've got now. And with that in mind, um, I would go to the Drug Foundation's website. They are, they are unashamedly um, looking to vote yes, but the information on there I find is incredibly good, and I, I recommend that. Very good. Sarah? Uh, Jared stole mine. Um, so, <laughs> so I was I was going to suggest the New Zealand Drug Foundation. I've got absolutely fantastic information. Nice and accessible too, isn't it? It's just so really well laid out. It's it, it, it really is, and um, and I'm in favour of evidence based drug reform. So, um, so absolutely, New Zealand Drug Foundation. And uh, from my end, uh, a shout out to my doctor, Dr. Brett Mann, on uh, <laughs> telling me that there's this neat academic article uh, from the New Zealand Journal of Medicine. So I would say that these are really wonderful advice that my colleagues have just passed on to you guys. And it's now your job to uh, do the rest of the work, to get informed and, uh, you know, to understand what the bill is all about. And... Uh, and then make the right decision. So in closing, uh, I just want to say a big thank you to, uh, to Neil, to uh, uh, Rachel, to Jared, and to Sarah for, for a very informative and thought-provoking uh, 90 minutes, I would say, and I hope that our audience uh, at home also learned a little bit about uh, this uh, referendum that we're going into. So uh, in my view, you know, I mean, the, the really why University of Canterbury has come up with this program is part of our town and gown initiative, really, and part of how we engage with you guys uh, out there in Christchurch, in Canterbury, and indeed in, in New Zealand. Uh, so, you know, without, uh, you know, I don't want to take much more time, but other than saying thank you very much uh, to you in, the, in, in YouTube land, uh, joining us today and allowing us to be part of your conversation as well as you mull over this very, very important decision. And as a, as a student of democracy and a political scientist, I'd, I'd really like to say that our duty as citizens is to, number one, study these things, to understand it, to learn it, right? And then the most important thing go out and vote, right? Go out and vote. 
right? Let me remind you, right? If you don't vote, you don't count, all right? And with that, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, guys. I learned a lot. Yeah, that was great.